Today is January 13th. Welcome to Bible study. We are continuing with our mission of getting our soul under control. We are looking at having a successful soul or a soul that leads us to success. And so I want us to go ahead and open up in prayer. Can I get someone to open us up in prayer on tonight? I can. <clears throat> Thank you, Abby. No problem. Father God, thank you, God, for bringing us here this evening, God, for um, allowing us to learn more about keeping our soul un under control. We thank you, God, for your love, for your mercy, God. We thank you, God, for our church family, God, for giving each and every one of us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, God. Father God, um, I decree and declare that we would all have a clear mind, that we will be able to apply what we're learning today that we would have um, an engaging session, God, where each and every one of us can um, participate, God, and, and uh, put some input there, God, in what we're learning today. We thank you, God, for our apostle, God. We thank you, God, for giving her the strength, the wisdom, um, the knowledge, dear God, and even the vision, dear God. So we just thank you for all that you're doing, God. We come to you, God, with full of gratitude, dear God. We declare and decree that each and every one of us have a mind of Christ, God. And we just give you all the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Abby. So um, as I've been praying about, you know, our direction, and we talked a lot, a lot on last week, um, one of the things that I realized is that uh, the foundation of, you know, many are, it's not where it needs to be in order to put you into a battle with an enemy who's been here from the beginning, right? So we wanna make sure that we're looking at this, but before I dive back into our topic for tonight, I wanna to go over um, and give anyone an opportunity to share a uh, testimony if you would like to. But the scripture that I've been using for this comes from 1 Peter 3, 15. And it reads, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always, 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 everyone, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. If you look at it in the Amplified, it says always, there's that word again, always. Be ready to give a logical defense to anyone who asks you to account for the hope and confident assurance elicited by faith that is within you, yet do it with gentleness and respectfully. So we want to make sure that we are sharing our testimony. We are sharing what the Lord has done for us recently. Have you ever noticed that when you go to churches and they have a testimony service, you usually get some older person who stands up and talks about something that happened that the Lord did for them in 1959? Though it is significant what God did for them, it is not necessarily relevant to those who are sitting in the room today. So they're looking to see, does God still heal? like he did back in 1959. Does God still see me and my situation? Does he understand what I'm facing? Does he know me like he knew you back in 1959? So they're looking for that evidence. And that's what this scripture is literally talking about. It's talking about us providing people with evidence that God is still God, that he is still the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. And as I go through our training on tonight, I'm going to really start to dig in about this engrafted thing because it's really going to give you some understanding as to why it's so important that our soul is under control, that we are not led by our emotions, shooting off the handle at any given moment. We don't know if today we're up, tomorrow we're down. We don't know which way we're going half the time, right? So it's time for us to pull it in, rein it in, 
and begin to show people who our God really is. He is going to use us in this season if we choose to take the necessary steps, if we choose to move forward in faith, if we choose to apply what it is that is written in his word, we will succeed because we are more than confidence. Hallelujah. I'm trying not to preach already if y'all ain't caught on. Amen. I was with mommy at the hospital on Sunday, so I didn't get to get that preach out. And it's like, it's in there, it's fighting, it wants to come out, right? All right. So when I asked the question, how are you displaying to the world that God is your father and Jesus is your brother? I'm going to open up with this every session, every training session. So be prepared to share something. There needs to be some type of a testimony that God did something for you, in you, or through you. Uh-oh, did y'all catch that? I'm going to say that again. God did something for you, in you, or he did something through you. When you're a baby, you do everything for the baby. But as the baby grows up and they start to learn things, something takes place on the inside of them. They learn how to control their bladder. They learn how to ask for what they want. Then they start learning how to utilize their brain to make what they need. Oh my, are y'all catching this today? And then from there, they move on and eventually start caring for younger siblings. They move on to caring for their own families or those that they have adopted as family and eventually move on to care for their parents if they're still yet alive. So we should constantly be progressing. We should not be remaining as babes in Christ. Are y'all with me on tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is this making sense? So talk to me. Somebody share with me. How are you displaying to the world that God is your father and Jesus is your brother? It's open. Well, I think I one way that I'm displaying, is someone else talking? I'm sorry. No, go for it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think one way that I am displaying that God is my father and Jesus is my brother is through um, caretaking of my parents. And I say that because I do it because I love them and because it's the right thing to do, I think. But my dad shared with me that the, um, his uh, nurse, I guess, at dialysis was commenting how nice it was for him to have daughters, a daughter, that do the things that we do for him, um, that so many parents don't have that. And so um, I think that is one way by honoring my parents, by honoring your mother and father, um, just being a caretaker for them and helping them in their time of need. Amen, 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 amen. Honoring your mother and your father that your days will be long in the land of the living. That is the scripture that um, she is referencing on tonight. And the importance of doing that, because there are so many people as they age, people forget about them, push them to the side. I worked in a nursing home and saw many who did not have a family member that came to see them and their family members lived right there in West Des Moines where I worked at. So it was really interesting to see that that's what they were doing. And I was longing for that grandparent because we moved here and didn't have grandparents I was longing for that that grandmotherly love that I was missing and so I latched on to them and that's why I didn't stay in that field because when they passed away I couldn't handle it I got too close and that's how that ended up happening so it's very very important if you look at it in the amplified as OC has it up it says honor respect obey and care for your father and your mother so that your days may be prolonged in the land the Lord your God gives to you. So that is huge. Thank you. George wanted to share? Yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, 
it's interesting how our, our grid group uh, continues to grow and change and uh, it, it's it's truly a struggle and a challenge and, and a blessing all in one. Um, we've got one fella that showed up one night, him and his, um, I don't think they're married, but I'm not real sure what their situation was. And he was struggling. They were both struggling. Um, just a lot, of, a lot of stuff going on with them. Uh, talked about having an PO appointment the next day and and then consequently he goes to a PO appointment. Of course, he's he's pushed the envelope so many times that she sends him back to Polk County. Well, through that whole situation, we've been uh, kind of walking with him a little bit and helping him get, uh, helping the, the lady get things through the food pantry and try to help him, her help him. But on another note, then, um, one of our other fellows, he, he ends up in a hospital with AFib. Then they uh, test him for COVID. Of course, he comes back positive for COVID, but he's got a whole lot of uh, uh, mental stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we've uh, recently been asked to, to uh, be part of the uh, secondary power of attorney mm -hmm. for him. Um, his sister had all but washed her hands of him even. Uh, so it's just still the opportunity to, to try to walk with him on that. But um, so there's, I mean, that's all still a challenge and, and we don't really know where any of that's going yet. There's a hearing tomorrow for him to uh, uh, have a, a court hearing about his competency. And uh, we've got feelings and opinions and, and even some facts, but that decision is not our decision to make. Um, a judge will hear on that. And then there's another couple that we've been, been working with uh, for quite a time frame, and they were not married. And uh, on Sunday, they are getting married. Amen. So we're, we have been pushing that they, you know, they were a couple, they're living together and they have children and and it's like, what's the deal? You know, mm -hmm. what's the deal? Why not? Mm -hmm. You know, what's, and um, so they've, they've chosen to, uh, to have the, have the Lord in their life and, and they want, they want to do their, their relationship right, even though it didn't necessarily start out right. Mm -hmm. They're going to try to mend what all that. And they've been working with their pastor on counseling and that as well as, and we're also, uh, starting our uh, marriage counseling yes. that, that you've you've instructed us with um we're going to start start actually dig into that next week as well so uh and right now it seems like it's couples mm -hmm. that are, are in our group mm -hmm. so, and that's huge and what that does is remember jesus discipled and you all are showing them that jesus is your brother and that this is the will of the kingdom the will of the king, right? That man be discipled, that they be taught about the kingdom that they're a part of. Because what happens is we are born again. Now, when you give birth, and I know I'm jumping ahead of myself, OC, so don't worry about it. When you give birth, the first thing that happens is that baby comes out and it is full of good. So for those of us who have had a baby, the baby is completely covered. It's covered in afterbirth. It's covered in blood. Some babies, their skin from being in the water for so long has like this paste on it. It looks like white paste all over them. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And so the babies are covered with this goop. What is the first thing after they make sure that the baby is strong enough to survive? What is the first thing that takes place with that child? Usually happens the next day. They've laid the baby on mom's chest. There's been some skin-to-skin -skin contact. They're making sure baby latches on. What happens after that the next day? Talk about the it. The umbilical cord? Well, they cut the umbilical cord right away. They do that right away. I'm talking about the next day. Oh, that's uh, for women? Answer that. No, you should be able to answer it as a father too. Not just for women. 
Maybe don't they do this the skin to skin? Well, we talked about the skin to skin. That happens usually the first day. They want that to happen right away. So the I next day, God. what happens bathing. is the soreness <laughs> sets in. Say that again, Belda. Soreness sets in because you're learning how to um, breastfeed and your milk ducts are starting to fill up and they sometimes can become engorged. Debbie said, say what you said. That, that's not it, Miss Felda. Bathing. That's bathe, it. They bathe. Right there. Your, your, your key word was the baby comes out with all this gook all over it. So when a baby is born, it comes out with blood. There is the uh, amniotic fluid. Sometimes they boo-boo in there. So they have poop on them or they can even ingest it. So the next thing they do is they bathe that child. They get rid of the afterbirth. Y'all catch that. There's a cleansing that takes place right away. And this is what's missing in the body of Christ today. We're preaching name it, we're preaching claim it, we're preaching prosperity, we're preaching all the things that have nothing to do with dealing with your inner me. We talk about the devil, we talk about all the enemies that are outside the door, we talk about all the sins of other people, but we never deal with our stuff. We don't, we don't bathe ourselves in the word. And so that has to happen. That discipleship must take place in order for us to move forward. Because what happens is we try to move forward with that dirt on us. And what do we do? Have you ever played with somebody who was dirty? Have you ever hung out with a person who was dirty? They, they just was dirty. I mean, they stunk. And come on, y'all talk about this because like y'all go out to um, yep. the camps. And you are having to deal with people. And I can tell you the first time that I had to deal with it, it was difficult for me to shake hands. It was difficult for me to receive. When we're in Tijuana, they want to give you their last, y'all. I don't care what it is. They want to share their sandwich with you. They want you to sit down with them. They want to peel an orange and hand you a piece of it. And I'm over here going, no way am I eating that. Right? And that's offensive. It's offensive to them. Because in their world, everybody shares and shares a lot. And they're like, look at these Christians looking down on us. But see, as Christians, we have to remember that people can see the dirt in our lives. We're not hidden behind a, a wall. We interact with people. Oh my, look at Pig Pen, y'all. So we're not hidden behind a wall. We're not stuck inside of our house. We are sitting right next to them. And they can see that messed up. And we talk about Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. F you. Right? Is that what we do? That's what I'm talking about. That's the dirt I'm talking about. How, look, O.C. done put his head down. How are we going to be doing that? Hey, girl, you come to church with me on Sunday? All right, I'll see you at the club tonight. Yo, pass me that joint. Hey, can I buy them pills from you? Oh, by the way, all you gotta do is tell the uh, tax man that you gave just under $250 and the IRS won't ever go and uh, check it. Because as long as it's under $250, you can use that as a tax deduction to reduce what you are supposed to pay. This is the dirt in our lives, y'all. It's got to be cleaned up because people are watching our every move. Whether we know it or not, they see it. Game recognizes game. Hallelujah. Game recognizes game. So we have to get to a place where we display to the world that God is our father. Jesus is our brother. How? Through the DNA sequence. We should have genetic markers, characteristics that look exactly like Jesus Christ. He already showed us exactly what God, his father, our father is looking for. So if he's already come and he walked the walk, he went through the same temptations according to the Bible that we've gone through. So we don't serve a high priest who doesn't understand what we've experienced or what we're going through because he endured it himself right here in the earth. He walked in the same flesh. 
Notice that what was the first thing that God did with Jesus after he was washed, he was bathed, right? Through baptism, y'all with me? If he trusted himself in flesh, why did he send him to the wilderness to be what? Tested. Oh my, did y'all catch that? That's good stuff right there. He sent Jesus to the wilderness to be tested as soon as he was bathed. So he gets dunked in the water. He comes up. The Lord speaks over him. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Boom. He's led into the wilderness by Holy Ghost. Uh-oh. Holy Ghost says, go over here to this wilderness so that I can test you in this flesh. I need to test me in this flesh. Make sure what I got them doing, they see they can actually do it. Greater works, you guys. But we got to get our souls under control. Our soul, again, is our what? Our mind, our will, and our emotions. Amen, 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 amen. So the way to get our souls under control is to deal with the wounds. And we learned all last year for probably about two months, the definition of the wound is an injury to living tissue caused by a cut, a blow, or other impact, typically, typically one in which the skin is cut or broken. So this is the definition. We have to deal with things that actually cut us because we are living souls according to the word of God. Is that right? We became a living soul when God did what? Breathe the breath of life in us. Do you have the breath of life in you? Because if you don't right now, we need to talk because I'm getting ready to wrestle some stuff up out of you. Amen? It's about to go. It's going down. Don't be up in here because I'm ready to fight. <laughs> Amen? So the things that have cut us, and, and think of how many times we have been cut by what people have said, what people have done, how they have hurt us. We've been cut by the things that have happened to us, blows that we took that we weren't expecting to happen, people dying, other impacts, the loss of a job, the loss of a marriage, all of these losses, those impact us, right? And we store those things up. And we don't realize because we don't ever deal with them. So we cover them up under, I'm blessed and highly favored, too blessed to be stressed. All of the jargon, church jargon that we use to make people think, oh, she's all right, she's good. Through COVID-19, one of the things that we heard, and OC was in these meetings with me, pastor after pastor after pastor came and said, because they was in church all the time, I didn't even know they were sick. I was like, wow, so what are you guys doing? How did you not know that they were that challenged? Now I will say some people who walked away from God, I was a little shocked by that, but you saw what was going on way before they got to this place. You could see the signs of that instability. You could see the signs that, I'm not sure if this God thing is really for me. You always knew it was there, but we kept hoping that they would just cross over. We had more hope for them than they had for themselves. So it was a shock, but it really wasn't a shock. So we've got to remember when we're dealing with wounds, we cannot ignore the wound. We can't just cover it up and hope that it heals on its own. What we've got to do is we have to deal with the wound. We've got to put that sap, that balm of Gilead, allow the Lord into that space and that place of hurt. It's difficult to go back and deal with it because you don't want to remember. You don't want to deal with the fact that you were hurt the way that you were, whether it was rape, whether it was molestation, whether it was a divorce, whatever it was. A lot of times we don't want to go back. Maybe your spouse cheated on you. You don't want to go back and feel that thing again, but you got to go back in that thing with Jesus Christ. You go back in that thing with the word of God. You go back in that thing with the power of God. And you go back in there with the healing of God. As long as you say, no, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to deal with that. It's going to remain a wound. Remember, wounds get what? Infected. When wounds get infected, they start to pus. They start to stink. There's pain involved. All of those things start to happen and it's no good. 
Next minute, you know, there's a loss of a limb. Those that walked away from Christ during this time of COVID-19 shelter in place, they had infected wounds and they severed themselves because God didn't cut them off. They severed themselves from him. They chose to walk away. I don't want this God thing no more. I'm tired of this. I don't want to do that no more. I want to do me. I want to live life my way. That's what this is. Those are wounds that have been infected that were never dealt with. So it's so important that we take the time to deal with the issues within our soul. Don't be afraid to look back with the word of God. Yes, they left me, but God said, I'll never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. He's got me. Anything that I need, he can fill that void for me if I allow him to do that. Yes, it feels lonely when you have to go home by yourself, but guess what? If I allow God into my home, he fills that place in that space. And in the presence, there's fullness of what? Joy. And the joy of the Lord is what? Our strength. Our strength. So now, not only do you get that, that presence of joy, that feeling that fills you up, but now you're stronger when you're facing whatever it is that you've got to face. But this is talking about dealing with a soul that is what? Under control. Because if you allow the barrage of thoughts to continue to hit you, you're going to follow the emotions that are assigned to that thought that you're meditating on. Instead of meditating on the word, you're choosing to meditate on your thought. That thought attaches to an emotion, attaches to the thought. You act on the emotion. It dictates your destiny. Is everybody with me so far? All right. Any questions over anything that I've shared? Anything anyone wants to add to that? While I take this good drink of coffee. And Abby drinks her water like a good girl. All right. <laughs> so last week when we left off, we were talking about being a part of the family of Jesus Christ. And the characteristics that we actually need to prove that God is our father, Jesus is our brother. And what I want to do, I want to build a little further on this foundation, because if we try to build without that proper foundation, what ends up happening is everything crashes down. Have you ever used cards to build a house? When you use cards to build a house, all it takes is for somebody to come by, wave a dog on a magazine past it, and that thing crumbles. There's nothing really supporting it. It's not in the foundation. Even with the foundation that we have, every wall that is built in here is what? Secured by a bolt, am I right? So when you're building anything, you have to make sure that each pillar is secure. And so the pillars are the, uh, the pieces and the areas within the word of God that we lean on or that support everything that we're doing. But you gotta have faith in those pillars because if you don't have faith in the pillars, you're never gonna depend on them and build around or on top of them. You'll never build out, nor will you ever build up. You have to trust that those pillars are gonna be able to support. This is where our faith comes in, y'all. Our foundation is Jesus Christ. Bottom line, he is the chief cornerstone. He is the, the foundation. If we build on anything else, the Bible actually tells us that it'll be declared what it actually is, if it's strong enough or not. It is going to make sure when the winds and the waves come, you're going to know what you built upon. Because if you built upon anything other than Jesus Christ, I promise you, this thing is going to fall apart. So notice, they're able to build in this particular house that he has on the street. The house of cards barely standing because there's no real pillars supporting it. But this house is a two-story, potentially three, if you are able to get into the attic somehow, maybe four, if, you, if there's a good basement. It looks like there's a basement there. I think I see a window. So with that, 
We're able to build up and notice what it has. It has the support of those strong fillers. And I guarantee that those um, wood plates that are on the inside of those walls are supported by bolts. They're held in place. So your faith is what's going to hold things in place. What you believe determines how far you can go. What you believe determines how high you're going to go. It's all of your faith, all of your trust in Jesus Christ and what he has given you ability to do, or is all of your faith and all of your trust in your own abilities, and then you put Jesus' name on it. I can cook. I can drive a car. I have credit to buy another house if we wanted to. I can easily go out and buy another house right now and say, God gave me a house and put Jesus' name on it very easily. And this is what you hear people do. God blessed me with this car. Hold on. God bless you with a car payment? Especially when it's a car payment that you can't afford and you're barely making it right now. Can we talk about this? What is it that we're putting and stamping God's name on that's really not from God? What is it that we are saying God has done for us, but really it's putting us in a position where it takes us away from God? Uh-oh. To the point where we don't want to say what God wants in this process. Mm. We said God did it, but we can't ever say it was at the beginning and the middle. Can't even identify how God did what he did. If you can't afford your bills right now, why would God give you a bill that you can't afford? You can't pay your rent right now. And so now he's going to bless you with a car payment with a high interest rate. That's the type of blessings that God gives. We got to watch our testimonies, y'all. Because our testimonies are contrary to what God's word says. What does the word of God say about only man? Oh, I'm nothing but love. That's it. Oh, no man, nothing but love. So if that is the case, we got to be wise in what we're telling people that God is doing or God has done. Amen. All right. So after I got done, um, there was a, a question about how is God our father and Jesus our brother, isn't he Lord? And I'm so glad that she asked that question because it was a fantastic question because like I said earlier, I realized how many people could not actually answer that question. So that lets me know that our foundations aren't quite there. If someone were to ask you on the street and you don't have to come out and tell me, hey, I can't answer it, but I need you to be honest with yourself. You don't have to say nothing to nobody else. But most of us could not answer it. We were Nick at night and came around the back door and was like, hey, you know, you want to explain that a little more? So we want to make sure that we've got the foundation in place. Or maybe we weren't quite sure about our answer. These are the things that we have to know, that we know, that we know, that we know. We've got to be able to say this with an assurity. We've got to be able to answer this with scripture. This is discipleship in action because what happens is we talk about it, but we can't prove it in the word of God. There has to become that transition. And I can quote the Bible darn near word for word. I can say exactly what the scripture says, but I have to cheat to tell you exactly where it's at. I can get you in the vicinity, but I can't tell you exactly where it's at sometimes. I'll be a scripture or two, maybe 10 off, but I'll be real close to where it is. You got to at least be able to navigate that much at a minimum, amen? We got to get to the place where when people talk to us about the word of God, we can prove through scripture what we are saying is true and why we're saying what we're saying. This is part of the reason why we've lost the generation that came up um, that the uh, 30, this about 30 year gap between me and that generation. We're losing them to crystals and all kinds of stuff because the only thing that they're hearing about are rules and they're not seeing the power. 
They're not seeing the necessity. They're not seeing where God is even worth following. The only testimonies that we have again are, God blessed me with a car payment. God bless me with this apartment. God bless me with this. That's, that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for the power. The power can only come through getting our soul under control. The power comes through that because otherwise what's in you infiltrates what God is trying to produce through you. Amen. So it makes it dirty. So I wanted to make sure that we go down this path just a little bit further and solidify what it is that we discussed. I did um, some uh, research on actually what it means to graft something in. And so that we can understand it as Jesus wrote it, not as we think it is. Because when we discussed it the other day, which was really good because it helped us to gain some clarity, but let's just be real. I need us to, to be honest. Amen. Everybody ready to be honest? Okay. Amen. Can we turn our, um, can we, can we turn our, our mics on real quick? Cause I want us to actually answer this. Actually, you don't have to turn your mic on, keep your mic off, but I need you to find the, the thumbs up or the hand raised emoji, one or the other, find it right now for me. How many of us actually left and went and studied being grafted in? How many of us did that? All right, so none of us went and studied. So what ends up happening is you come, you hear, that's great, but can you recite, can you regurgitate? Are you at a place where you can actually regurgitate what's been talked about? How does this apply to you in your walk currently? What is it going to do um, for you in your life? And how is it going to improve what you are doing with other people around you? So do we understand the importance of not only being discipled, but discipling others? That is how we advance the kingdom. I can't just go over there to that car lot and tell them, hey, God sent me over here and I'm taking over your property right now. I'm advancing his kingdom. I'm going to jail, y'all. I am going to jail. Do you understand that? They're going to call me cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and they're going to say, get off my property. I'm calling the police. And if I stand there and say, no, God said for me to do this, I'm going to do it. I'm taking over your land. It now belongs to me. I'm either going to get shot they're going to stand their ground and they're going to call the police and they're going to tell me you're trespassing, get off this property or you're going to jail. How do we advance the kingdom? We advance the kingdom by what we disciple others to do. The things and the territory that we take in our own mind and in our own household, in our own bloodline, this is advancing the kingdom. So we have to take the time to study these things out and gain this understanding. Who can remember some of the scriptures that we talked about last week? Does anyone remember the scriptures we talked about by chance? Was it in Romans? There was a scripture in Romans. Yeah. Romans 11, 23. Yep. Yeah, Romans. Yep. Yeah. And so that was actually talking about being grafted in or engrafted, okay? That scripture was talking about it. So if you look at Romans 11 and you study that out, you're going to understand what it means. And notice that when Jesus was, or uh, Paul was talking about being grafted in, he was using that from an agricultural standpoint. He was talking about olive branches, Okay. So he was looking at it from an agricultural standpoint. We also looked at Luke 1, 26 through 38. We talked about Jesus being born of a woman, right? And that Gabriel showed up, gave Jesus, uh, Mary Jesus' name, said, this is what you're going to call it. Holy Spirit and the power of God overshadowed her. 
Jesus was conceived. They entered her just as Jesus enters us. So that same power, Holy Spirit, is where? In us. So the same way that Jesus is in the earth, we are in the earth the same. Amen? In order for us to understand the power that's actually running through us and who we really are, we've got to acknowledge that as Jesus was in the earth, so are we. Amen? Are y'all with me on that? Any questions over what I just said? What was the other scripture other than Romans you said? Um, Luke 1, 26 through 38. First John 4, 17, real quick, because I want them to see this, that I'm not just making this up. First John chapter four, verse 17. Um, you can do New King James, that's fine. All right. Let's read um, verse 17 through 19. Amen. Can I get a reader? Love has been, go ahead, go ahead, Ab. Oh, okay. I'm reading from an LT. It says, um, you said 17 through 19, right? Uh-huh. Um, and as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we would not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in, the, in this world. Stop right Touch there. Stop right there. I need you to just hold that right there. Did you hear what you just said? Read it one more time in that last part of the sentence. I need you to slow down and hear what you just said. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live, okay. <laughs> we live like Jesus here in this world, got it. Okay, so that was cute, right? Because we live like Jesus here in this world. Jesus was in the earth. He was walking around. He had a mommy. He had a daddy. He was so cool. He loved God. Take it to the New King James. Let's read it here. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Oh my. The, that means whole different thing. The way that Jesus is in this world, what he did in this world. So now when you're hearing greater work, shall you do? Does that, feel, does that sound a little bit different to you? Does that make a little more sense to you? All of a sudden, when I read this power like this, wells up in me. Do y'all see this? Because as he is, as he is, so are we. So am I in this world. That's, that's different. As he is, so am I in this world. So the same way Jesus was here and the same things Jesus did in this world, I can do too. Go ahead to verse 18. And then it goes on. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. In other words, you've not let God into that space and that place 
You're still afraid that you're not good enough. You're still afraid that you're going to be rejected when you stand before God. You still fear that you've not been forgiven. How many times have you ever asked, and I just need to ask y'all, have you ever asked someone, do you know where you're going to end up when you die? Have you ever asked anyone? A lot. A lot. And what are their answers to that, Katrina? I got, uh, some say yes, some say I think so, and some, they just, I don't know. And when they say, I think so, what do you say? I'm like, either you, either you know or you, or you, or you don't know. I'm like, there's, there's no in between. And then I normally get the, oh yeah, yeah, I'm going. Mm. So depending on who it is, I might, I, I might push a little harder, but it, sometimes mm -hmm. people put walls up and they'll kind of like, they don't want to go any further. So then mm -hmm. just depends, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I recently asked that question from a person that I'm very close to. And I said, you know, I keep hearing you make this comment. And I said, when you die, do you know where you're going? And they said, I hope so. And I said, so why do you hope so and not know so? I just want to understand your thought process. And they said, well, I used to be a really bad person. And I said, yeah, but Jesus died for all the stuff that we used to do. So what is it that is stopping you from believing versus just hoping? And so we walk through the scriptures about our sins being thrown in the sea of forgetfulness, that there is nothing you can do to separate you from God's love. We walk through the scriptures and their response was, I know where I'm going. So when we approach that, we, we can alter our, our approach, I guess, the way that we attack it because the enemy wants them to be fearful and think that God can't love them for what they've done. God can't love them past their mistake. God can't love them past their past. So that's what he wants us to think. This is what he wants us to believe, but it's a lie from the pits of hell. When you repent and you turn away from it, it doesn't mean that those things aren't going to try to rise up again because they're going to try. The Bible actually says that the devil left Jesus after he tempted him for 40 days and 40 nights. Then we see the three main temptations that we all talk about. But he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights and he ate or drank nothing. Then you see the main three. And next minute, you know, it says he left Jesus for a more opportune time. Well, let me see, since I couldn't catch you here, let me see if I come back around this way, if I can get you there. So it doesn't mean that we're not going to be tempted anymore just because we've given our lives to Christ. We're still going to be tempted. We're still going to endure issues, things, problems, things that used to feel real good to us. Every now and again, you'll get that itch to, I mm, wonder what a margarita might taste like right now while I'm stressed. Every now and again, that thought will come up, but you got to cast that thing down. Casting down every imagination and every high thing that tries to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. This is what that is about. Those temptations that just happen to come back around. Amen? So perfect love casts out all fear because he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Verse 19. says, he's trying to pop it up there for y'all. We love him because he first loved us. That's deep. Wait a minute. You love me while I was jacked up. You love me while I was cussing, sleeping around. You love me while I was just acting a plum donkey, a fool. 
You love me when tomorrow I get up and I don't feel like doing nothing because I'm in my emotions and in my feelings. You still love me? You love me first? Knowing all of this, if God, if Jesus knows the end from the beginning, you think he didn't know all of this that we were going to do? But he still what chose us? I'm still chosen. Still royal. Hello, somebody. I'm still all that. That's good stuff, yeah? Amen? Y'all with me so far? Any questions or comments anyone would like to expound upon what has been shared? Give me one thing you're learning. A couple of people. Let me hear something, because I need to know that you're understanding. I've given you a lot and I ain't even touched being grafted in yet. Well, I can, I'll start us off. So when, when you were talking about how, you know, Jesus died for our sins and all the things are covered, that wraparound, it's addressing now those triggers that used to get us. Oh. So even though we, we give our life to Christ, we recognize what we've done, it doesn't, it doesn't take away that we have to now go back and address those former triggers. Because if we don't, then they're always sitting there waiting to try to take us out. That's good. And so then it's learning how to address those triggers a different way. It's kind of like we have to learn then how do we bring Jesus to the party now? Uh -oh. How do we do that? We say it, but now how do we do it? It's like you first go get your big brother for a fight, but now you got to take him. Because he can still say no, but Jesus said yes. yes. So now we're taking him there. But then when you take your big brother for the fight, now you got to figure out how we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. We can get there, but how are we going to do it? Mm -hmm. and, and so am I going to trust you yes. to fight with me yes mm -hmm. yeah am I going to trust you to fight with me that you're not going to get there and duck out oh you did that's what you did oh I didn't know you did all that I'm out mm -hmm. none of that matters with Jesus Christ he's already knowing what we did if he is omnipresent there's nothing that he's not seen his eyes are everywhere at one time Omnipresent, y'all. Omnipotent, there's nothing more powerful than him. Omniscient, he's all-knowing. He already knows. So you're not a surprise. You might have been a surprise to your parents, but you're not a surprise to him. You were born on purpose, for a purpose, and with purpose. Amen? Amen. Come on, somebody from online. Talk to me. What are you hearing? I can go. Um, so I'm going to talk about the revelation. And, and it's a revelation that I've had before, but it's funny how different things hit you at different times. And just the fact that <clears throat> greater works shall we do. Then, and then Jesus, right? We're going to do things greater than him. And what's pretty cool is the fact that you brought up, even though God knows from the day before we were born, everything we're going to do, all the, the bad things, all the other stuff, yet he still, yet we still have this power of Jesus in us. And that's what's kind of enlightening or um, <clears throat> just makes me, it gave me pause to think again about it, or like I said, it was revelation again. Sometimes it takes hearing things, you know, again to just let it soak in and, and say, wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I did some stuff. I did some stuff in my child, in my youth, and probably in and in my adulthood. But God loves me, and He knew I was going to do those silly things, but He knew what he put in me that would be get me to where I am today and that I can't I gotta recognize all that I have all that power that you kind of just showed us a little bit ago so that it was just again a revelation for me that's good stuff you know um Lachelle and I were talking on I want to say it was Monday maybe Tuesday but um we were just kind of talking through something. And I remember saying to her, 
I've said this over the years. Now does it make sense? And she said, oh my gosh. And she began to give me examples of how it makes sense now. But it wasn't until she got to that place and had experienced certain things that she could actually connect what I was saying. This is where you hear me say some things are better caught than taught. That's what that is. You're catching it now because you can actually apply it now. So I can teach you, but it, you don't have any understanding. Wisdom is the principal thing. You know where it's supposed to go, when it's supposed to happen. But it says, but in all you're getting, get understanding if you don't understand why it's supposed to go there you're not going to implement it when it needs to go there because you're going to still be wondering is this really the right time i don't know if this is really right so now you're catching it because you have hit a place in your life it's that opportune time or the fullness of time has come that's what that is. It's like this is the perfect time. It's a that I want to use the word cataclysmic, you know, impact is right there. Boom, here it is. Now it explodes. I got it. That's what that is. That's a good way to describe it because that's kind of what you feel when something connects, when it clicks, and it's like, wow. So you're that's a really good way to describe it. Amen, amen, amen. All it's right, one more like, person. Go ahead, Shell. Well, it's kind of like, you know, the, the light bulb finally comes on and you're like, wow, have you ever looked like at a board and where the strings all connect, you know, and they all meet in the middle and, and it, it's finally like, you can see it all from corner to corner. It's so clear to you now. Um, things that you have been saying to me for years years and I I couldn't I didn't catch it like I caught it um when we talked about it um everything is um become clear and made a lot of sense but That's it good. took it took time um you know walking through it with God for all the pieces to come together it's like working on this puzzle um mm -hmm. a 5,000 piece puzzle and you've been working on it and working yeah. on it and working on it Mm -hmm. And finally, you know, you got that last piece in there and you're like, wow, that's that's kind of what it meant to me. Mm -hmm. Makes perfect sense. Uh, O.C. and uh, Kamika and I had a meeting a uh, couple of weeks ago and um, I was explaining to them that God keeps showing me puzzles. I keep seeing these puzzles and what he was showing me is that I needed to put the framing in first before I did anything else. But I was trying to work from the inside and I was getting overwhelmed with the number of pieces. But he said, if I go ahead and put the outside that frame first, I'll be able to fill in the rest of the gaps. And so it helped me to understand what it is that he's doing. And then here you just bring up puzzles. So you're definitely in the vein of what God is doing and what he's saying, speaking to me right now as your apostle and as the apostle over this ministry. And I mean, it's, it's just amazing how God is really pulling things together and putting them together so that they make sense. And so when you think about um, grafting in, let's go ahead and bring it in. We're going to dig a little bit deeper. Let me see what time it is while I'm digging. It's 8.13. Can y'all give me 10 more minutes? Can y'all do that for me? Okay. Um, I want to talk about how tree grafting works. It, it really was eye-opening for me, biblically, scripturally. It started to make a lot of things that the Bible says make sense. Because if you put it from the perspective of us being grafted in and what that process actually entails. Scriptures just started going boom, boom, boom. They were firing off in my head. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, like kind of like what Debbie just said that you just have that big bang and all of a sudden the light comes on and boom, here it is in this revelation. And so it really um, blessed me to see this. 
And I hope that you all get this wonderful revelation from what we're going to talk about and dig into as we go through this. Now, I'm not going to um, get into pages three, four, five, and six, but I want to um, get started just so that you can understand first how it works, first natural, then spiritual, well, how it's actually defined biblically so that we can get this understanding. Because as I build on this foundation, we're going to be able to build out and then you're going to grow up. Does that make sense, everybody? You with me? Amen. All right. So how does tree grafting work? Grafting trees begins with a healthy root stock, which should be at least a few years old with a firm, straight trunk. You must then find another tree which can bear the fruit, referred to as the scion. Scions are usually second year wood with good leaf buds and about a quarter to a half inch in diameter. It is important that this tree be closely related to the rootstock tree. After cutting a branch from the scion diagonally, it is then placed into a shallow cut within the rootstock's trunk. This is then binded together with tape or string. From this point, you wait until the two trees have grown together with the scion branch, now a branch of the root stock. Y'all, are y'all catching this? Am I the only one getting excited? At this time, all the top growth from root stock above the graft, <laughs> do y'all hear this, is removed so that the grafted branch, the scion, becomes the what? new trunk. This process produces a tree that has the same genetics of the scion, but the root system of the root, woo, root system of the root stock. Do y'all see this? Okay, why am I the only one all excited? Everybody else is like, womp, womp. <laughs> Online, did y'all get anything from that? For me, what one of the things that I hear in here is regeneration. Okay. The regeneration of, of the, the plant, the, the tissue, whatever it is. That uh, if we tap into his his foundation, his root, then we're going to be regenerated. Okay, that's good. Regeneration, I hear that. Talk to me online. What are you hearing? When you hear what I just read, what do you hear? I took off running in my own house. I'm just going to let y'all know. Because when I break this thing down for you, it's going to blow your mind. Talk to me. What are you seeing in this? Nothing. I feel like we like we have joined in now. We have new uh, new roots. Like those old ones have fallen off, but we have gained new ones, stronger ones that go deep. Becoming one with the root. Becoming one with the root. Right, and that's what I got out of it. Becoming. I mean, we are still ourselves is what I'm getting. We've, so if, if we were looking at this in, in our imagine, Holy Ghost imagination, Jesus is that trunk is where I, I'm thinking I'm going. And then we are that little scion, right? And he's, because of um, the way, <laughs> the way God has, has de deemed it to be, once we become part of his, of the family, right? Once we become part of, of Jesus, of God, we become one of those, uh, that, that offshoot, but we have that, that trunk of Jesus, right? We've got that whole inner, we've got Jesus there. We just started, we've shot off that little scion, if that makes sense. <laughs> I'm trying. 
Okay. Anybody else want to say what they got out of this? <coughs> I, I took it as that, at, at like Debbie, that Jesus is the root and that we um, are that Shion and that because he's the root, our, the roots stay the same and we keep his roots. It's kind of what, how I took it. I want us to broaden a bit. I want us to think about what we're talking about today. What is this Bible study about? About being grafted in. Yeah. We're real siloed in our approach. And what we're, that's why we're missing the big picture. So I need us to, to broaden our perspective. And I want us to really think because this goes all the way back to the beginning. Okay. He had to find another tree. Why? Why did Jesus need to find another tree? Let's, let's start from the beginning. It starts with the healthy rootstock, which we already know what that is, right? Jesus was a few years old. He was what, 33? When he passed, somewhere in there, depending on whose theology you follow. The second sentence is, you must then find another tree. What was wrong with the first tree? And notice what it says. You must find another tree that can what? Bear fruit. Oh my. Can you bear fruit? What fruit are you bearing? Is it fruit that remains or fruit that needs to be pruned and destroyed? And I want us to think about the church at large. This is what we're talking about, y'all. We're not talking about ourselves. We're talking about the entire body of Christ. This is bigger than just us. We got to come out of our silos. Remember what I said earlier, right? I went first natural, then spiritual. I talked about, does anybody remember what I said about how it starts as us within us. Remember that? Does it, did anybody write that down? I'm just going to throw God the whole. Something, something for you and then in you and then through you. Did y'all catch that? First, he does something for you. Then he does something in you. Then he does something through you. Write that down. It's very important that we write that down and that we understand this. This is our foundation. We cannot be as Jesus is in this world if we don't understand that he wants to do something through us. If we can't bear the fruit, if we can't take in the new wine and redistribute it, that's why he had to find another tree. The old wine skins could not handle the coming of Jesus Christ. Is this making sense? Okay, so they must be able to bear the fruit. They've got to be strong enough to bear the fruit. When you bear fruit, you have to be able to hold up the fruit that's hanging off of you, the fruit that's being produced from you. It's important that the tree be closely related to the rootstock tree. We're all part of the human race, right? That's pretty simple. We are all human beings. We all have the capability, but we were separated because there was the children of Israel who were the chosen, but now we have become the engrafted ones, the chosen people. So there is a shallow cut that goes within the trunk it's bound together. And from that point, you have to wait until the two trees do what? Oh, they grow together. And it now is a branch of the actual rootstock. 
This is how we have the power. Because now when you start to think about John 17 and, and how Jesus talks about pruning and all of that, when he gets to talking about all of that, it's going to make a whole different, it'll have a whole different meaning for you now. Anything that needs to be pruned, he prunes it so that I can bear more fruit. That grafted branch now becomes the new trunk. God did away with that old crap. The traditions of man which made the word of God of no effect. It produces a tree that has the same genetics, but the root system of the root stop. That is huge, you guys. What I want us to do, I'm gonna stop here because I can tell you guys your, your heads are like, what is she talking about? And in order for me to go deeper, I'm gonna have to give you a lot more scriptures. And it is actually, what time is it? All right, it's almost 8.30. I'm gonna stop here. So what I'm gonna do, I'm going to um, ask Pastor O.C. to send this slide out, put it on the band. And I want you guys to start digging into this. When we come back on next week, I'm going to start to break this whole thing down like a fraction, and I'm going to go blow for blow with scripture for scripture. So we're going to come in. We're going to give our um, testimonies of how we are ensuring that the world knows that God is our father and that Jesus is our brother. And then we are going to go right in and start talking about grafted in and the scriptures and start to bring some clarity to all of this. Why am I so excited about this? I'm like, whoa, do you understand what this means? And, and no one's getting it. I get it because I studied it. So it's like, yay, I'm all over the place right now, right? So I'm having a little trouble sitting here and, and being all excited about this but I need us to understand it so that you can begin to be as Jesus Christ is in the earth, so are you. I want you to begin to reflect that scripture and it's gonna come through you understanding who you're connected to. When I understand that I don't have to be great because greatness is in me, that cuts that whole spirit of rejection thing right on off at the door. That closes the whole gate, y'all. It shuts it down where the enemy can't go through and be like, well, you can't, you can't. You're right, I can't. But guess what? He can. Through me. He can. Through me. As Jesus Christ is in the earth, so am I. So am I. Greater is he who lives where? In me than he that is where? In this world, shut your mouth, spirit of rejection. We're done. I'm no longer a victim. I'm victorious. I am here to tell you, you guys, it honestly works if you work the word. But you have to have an understanding before you can work the word. So this is so huge. Please, guys, please go back, read this. It's going to be on band. Start to dig through the scriptures. Start to ask the Holy Spirit. Recall to my remembrance what you're talking about. What is this? What does this, what, how does this connect to your word? How do I grow together with you? What does this look like? Especially when it says at this time, all the top growth from the root stock above the graft is removed. Oh, what do you think that is? Oh my, go read Romans 11. Go read it. Because all of a sudden you're going to see where he starts to talk about that cutoff. That's what this, that's what it's talking about. Go read Romans 11. I want you to read this, read Romans 11. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about it. And then I'm going to break it down. Sound good, everybody? Are we committed? Yes. All right, we commit. We're gonna do this. We're gonna grow this year, y'all. Amen. We're gonna grow up. Amen. Father, we just thank you on today, oh Lord, Father God. We just thank you for the lesson that was taught. 
Lord, we just ask, oh Lord, Father God, we, Holy Spirit, we just ask that you help us with our wisdom, with our knowledge and understanding, and give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding as well. Um, Lord, we just we just thank you for the revelation, oh Lord, Father God, that you have given us apostle, oh Lord, Father God, and, and Lord, let this uh, come clear, oh Lord, Father God, to the rest of us, oh Lord, Father God, for next week, and Lord, let us study and show ourselves approval, Lord, Father God, in all of this, O oh Lord, Father God. And Lord, we just thank you, O oh Lord, Father God, because you do not give us the spirit of fear, O oh Lord, Father God. And Lord, every day we should pick up our cross daily and walk and follow you, God. Yes, Lord. So, Father, we, we, we praise you on today, and we ask, O oh Lord, Father God, that you cover us in our sleep, O oh Lord, Father God, on tonight, and Lord, cover us that are have to travel, Lord, Father God, give us traveling grace, oh Lord, Father God, and Lord, give us traveling grace on tomorrow, Lord, Father God. And Lord, we will give you all the honor and all the glory. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.